You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your dependent but not diseased host, Abraham. And I'm your cure-seeking host, Shane. Ooh, we're a psychology podcast. We talk about all the things that people and animals do. We talk about like mathematical models and diagnoses. And currently, and over the last couple of weeks and for the next few future weeks, we are talking about the very complex discussion that is addiction in various formats. Yes. And so we have a suite of topics that we're going to cover. We're going to try to unpack them and give them all the space they deserve. And today we are talking about this idea that many people talk about, which is that addiction is a disease. And we're going to talk about kind of what that means, what that looks like, and maybe unpack a little bit of that and kind of talk about why that might not be the most useful way to have a discussion about this. Yeah, I think this is going to be one of the maybe surprising ways that people have Because I think a lot of people have more or less accepted and built into their discussions, their advocacy even, of addiction by talking about it using the sort of disease model framework. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that these people who are advocates for supporting people with addiction and dependency by using the disease model framework. And we're going to do our best to sort of talk through why the implications for that and why we think there might be an alternative way that would be even more effective to consider conceptualize how dependency works and what we can do about it. Sure, absolutely. But before we do that, we've got some stuff to do, right? We've got some things to celebrate. Indeed, yes. So this episode publishes on April 10th, and April 10th has day is a day, and therefore it is a day of holidays. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we do holidays on days. So today is ASPCA Day. So if you uh, like Sarah McLaughlin, it's a really great day to celebrate. I love that. (laughs) Encourage a young writer day. Fantastic. Get out there and write. I love that. It's global work from home day, which, you know, I like that every day. Is that a, that might be only a few years old, I'm guessing. (laughs) I think so. (laughs) Yeah. I'm surprised it's not in March, but sure. There's also the international day of pink, maybe also called Barbie day. Yeah. Barbie stoked. It's also international safety pin day. So all of those punks in high school that decide to pierce their ears with safety pins, (laughs) you're welcome. (laughs) Sure. National Cinnamon Crescent Day. Yum. Sounds delicious. It's National Farm Animals Day. So, uh, but not like Animal Farm Day. Like that's a different one. That's, you know, that's an allegory for communism and all the real dictatorship and stuff like that. Maybe not that one, but farm animals in general. We like animals. I love farm animals. I've always wanted to like be friends with a pig. I really like pigs. They're so wonderful. I think you could have one now. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I would like an emotional support pig. But speaking of farm animals, it is also National Hug Your Dog Day, which is, I mean, you could conceptualize as a farm animal in one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. Also, speaking of farm animals, it's National Sibling Day. So my brother is definitely (laughs) some kind of farm animal. I'm not quite sure what he would be. (laughs) A goose. (laughs) A silly goose, if if you will. (laughs) It is apropos of this suite of topics, and particularly as we get into some of the later topics that we will be having, so not directly related to today, but anyway, it is National Youth HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. It'll be very important. Yes, very important. Now, as far as weeks go, it is Bat Appreciation Week. (laughs) Sweet. (laughs) Yeah, right? That's not in October. It's also Uh, Be Kind of Spiders Week, also not in October. I think I might have pulled the wrong date. No, it's it's a great week for goths. It's also Eid al Fitur Day. So um, to our friends who celebrate, I want to make sure I get this right. They say Eid Mubarak, so okay. which is to celebrate and break the fast. Ah, I see. It does kind of sound like eat a fritter. Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I could see breaking the fast with a fritter. That would be delicious. It is Explore Your Career Options Week. Yes, and it's also uh, to go with Exploring Your Career Options Week. It's Hate Week. <laughs> and the National Library Week. Some people hate the library. I guess that's a thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people who just like, you know, people in Florida tend to hate libraries because there's books that there. That is true. And people <laughs> hate books. <laughs> that's that's Florida Week is National Hate the Library Week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just combine those two weeks. It's great. It's very cool. 
we do talk about holidays mostly just, you know, for fun and to sort of say this is a piece of trivia you can now share with people around you. If you're listening to this right bright and early in the morning, well, good on you for staying so on top of your episodes. But now you can tell people <laughs> that it's International Safety Pin Day or whichever of those holidays stood out to you. Apparently safety pins for me. But we're actually not talking about those holidays as our primary discussion. As we said, our primary focus for this discussion is going to be talking about the sort of philosophical approach to thinking about and conceptualizing addiction by looking at and using the diseased model of sort of looking at addiction specifically as a disease and why that sort of model exists and and what we think about that. To kind of give a little bit of insight on this, you're going to find that in any sort of space where there's treatment or trying to conceptualize some type of you know, phenomenon, you're going to find people that kind of have different viewpoints and perspectives. I mean, we've kind of talked about this on the show before where we tend to take a behaviorist bent in the world of psychology, but there are people that take more of a Freudian bent or a Jungian belt or what, you know, whatever, like there's, there's a lot of different ways to kind of like look at a thing. And so it's important to kind of understand walking into this. That's kind of where this comes from. But the disease model is actually kind of a medical approach to, to understanding the idea of addiction. And so when you apply a disease model in general, the disease model, what it does is it looks at the idea that we focus on what is wrong with a person in an effort to fix that issue. Not necessarily that person themselves is is wrong or broken or anything like that. What we tend to look at is that there is something going wrong with that person in, in whatever homeostasis, whatever environment they're looking at. Basically, they have a disease. Yeah. And because there is a disease, we we have an opportunity to fix that disease, not the person themselves. Yeah, they they have a pathology, you know, they have a, let's just say some kind of flu or some illness that we know about. We administer cure. We inject them with some medication, penicillin or whatever that's going to help with whatever disease they are and disease goes away. And so the, the like, well, let's just apply this to addiction. Like they have a pathology. Let's inject them with cure. Disease goes away. And so in different terms, part of, I think, the motivation for this approach is to extract blame. We say the organism is not to blame. We don't blame someone for catching a flu. We don't blame someone for like getting cancer. They, we don't blame them, right? Rather, they got sick and they must be treated to address that sickness. And I think there's we can understand the ethos and the compassion and the desire to try and see this as an issue that requires attention and a model that has been successful at Helping support people when they have these situations has been the medical model by calling you by with disease. Right. And so I think that, you know, you're going to find that this approach is going to have more of a moral and social type of like implication to it, whereas like the medical piece doesn't really. Have, you'll see what we mean when we get into it. I'll, I'll leave that discussion for later. So. What the disease model of addiction does is it focuses on addiction as a disease, meaning that it's effectively an ailment that the organism obtains. Like they come into it. It is not necessarily something that and and we'll kind of talk about different ways this comes up, too. But it's not something that they have chosen, per se. Usually people who oppose this model tend to say people chose to get into addiction. And that's there's its own problems inside of that, too. Right. But this is kind of saying that the person did not choose. They have kind of come into this ailment. And they are dealing with that as is. Yeah, and and we've, I think, unpacked choice to some extent in, in past discussions and why I think that that's not a particularly helpful framework for understanding how behavior unfolds in the first place anyway, because I think it very incorrectly assigns the locus of control. A choice also is a locus of control inside of the organism. And that's why I think this one tries to extract that. It tries to pull back from this to saying, like, you're at fault because you wouldn't be at fault for, like, getting, you know, you know, some other disease that that people get. And it almost doesn't matter even if you are at fault because we're going to treat it anyway, which I think is a whole nother discussion. But right. You know, we just recently talked about Alcoholics Anonymous and this this idea of addiction as a disease really developed from that. And it was specifically an effort to help shift the perspective on like, these are people who need support. We like, they need help. They need some kind of system to support them through this, to get them on the other side of things. And so we don't blame the person. We blame the illness. Like that's, that's sort of the general ethos there. Right. Which I, you know, we can get on board with. I I agree with that uh, general sentiment at least. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea. Right. And so, you know, as we get into this later, I am 
sure that we'll talk about a circumstances view. Yeah. You know, we're, we're going to have to at some point in time. But I think also worth unpacking inside of this is that addiction is often categorized within the world of brain diseases. So this is kind of an interesting thing. Some of the conversations I've seen around this is that addiction is a brain disease, and sometimes brain diseases are also called neurodegenerative diseases, and they refer to diseases that cause brain and nerves to deteriorate over time. So, you know, if you look at overuse of a substance, then yes, it will cause damage to parts of the body, including the brain. And brain diseases are often things like stroke, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, TBI, acquired and organic brain injuries. So you you start to kind of see that those diseases are something that are a little bit different categorically compared to addiction. Addiction tends to be a behavioral thing that leads to other things, whereas the like, you know, somebody can't control that they've got a stroke. But we'll like I said, we'll talk about a lot of this inside of that. And I think it's just worth knowing that brain diseases are categorized as diseases underneath this medical model as well. Well, and arguably, because you you just interestingly use the words they can't control, and I think arguably when we talk about addiction, it is characterized in this lack of control, and that was a part of the Alcoholics Anonymous sort of thing, right? Like, yeah. is like you don't have control, but you need like, and you can't have control, right? You need to just give control over, and then you will be helped give control over to God or higher power or whatever doorknobs as we discussed in that episode. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) But what that means is I think full of other implications that are, that are, are maybe not as straightforward as they kind of even sound like what does control mean? But anyway, let's go ahead and get into the characteristics of a disease model. Specifically in relation to a disease model of addiction, there are some core assumptions that I think, when when people are talking about it, we have to we have to make a note of because this is kind of where people lean on this. First is that addiction is a discrete diagnosable medical condition with very specific symptoms that include withdrawal symptoms and different physical things that come along with this. But that is one of the primary assumptions of addiction as part of a disease model. There's also an observed pathology related to the disease. And with addiction specifically, the primary pathology is this loss of control idea. This essentially you are sort of being driven, guided, and pulled along by the behaviors associated and surrounding this dependency. Absolutely. And then the third assumption that they talk about inside of this is that addiction requires specialized treatment, which, you know, when you think of other diseases like cancer or, you know, epilepsy, those also require specialized treatment. So these, again, are assumptions of the disease model that say addiction is diagnosable. It's discrete. It comes with symptoms. It's a specific there's a specific pathology related to it and it requires special treatment. So far, all that being said, I'm good with that. That all makes sense so far. Yeah, you can see those parallels. Like they overlap pretty availably. Like you can see exactly how that happens. Right. And there are variations inside of the disease model, too, that are worth discussing. There's the exposure model, which argues that disease is acquired due to prolonged or excessive exposure to said disease. Right. And then there's a susceptibility model, which is the argument that people who have genetic predispositions may already have the disease without exposure or they are particularly vulnerable. So, and I think both of these are important to kind of unpack as well. But before we do that, I think we're going to give everybody a little bit of space because we're going to have a big, long discussion about this. So we're going to do some ads. We're going to come back and we're going to riff real hard on this. You might say that the disease of podcasts is ads. (laughs) Nice. Okay, so we, <laughs> we we sweated the fever out, the fever that was ads. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this more and sort of, I think, unpacking the whole disease model and and what we've discussed so far and, and how, like, we do see parallel. Like, it's not that we don't understand why this came to be or why it had some utility and, and where people could easily sort of look at this is what how diseases work and we have a very similar overlap with how addiction works. And I think that is more or less understanding that humans are biological organisms, right? Right. Like, and so we, our behavior is conceptually related to medical things because our behavior exists in the context of our biological being. And so when biology breaks down, our behavior changes. When biology changes, our behavior changes. And when our behavior changes, our biology changes oftentimes because our bi- we'll do things that affect what our, what our biology does. And it's just this really intermeshed 
something that you cannot dissect. It is non-linear. It is not a direct like this, then this thing. It is this constant dynamic interaction of our biological organism in a stimulating environment. And that is where we start to see what these things look like. Yeah. They don't play as nicely together, if you will. Like what I mean by these things is like illnesses and behaviors start to look a little different when you get to considering like how behavior works. Yeah, I think that's actually a really great distinction because, you know, an illness is going to require your and to me, maybe this is just that this is an ignorant understanding of this. But like to me, illness requires your biology to fight it, where addiction is so reliant on behavior to continue to access it. Right. Like, I feel like there's this piece where, you know, addiction is perpetuated by the fact that somebody is using and using and using or obtaining that substance and, and, and connecting with that substance. Now, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that's like, we need to be really clear about those distinctions, but I do think that that is a difference between like having a cold and your body, your biology fighting off a cold, you know, or your body repairing after a stroke. Those are very different processes, I would argue, than the process of addiction, which is a lot of those symptoms come from a behavioral outcome, right? It's the outcome of some set of behaviors that you engage in, at least on some level. Like I said, I have a really hard time, too, because when we start talking about this as a disease, so often in the medical model, you can pinpoint something, some causal effect of not maybe not of the disease itself, but, you know, the symptoms that somebody has, like there's a very specific thing. A specific pathology that we look at that's like a biological pathology and addiction has these biological processes, but there's not like it doesn't become a biological pathology until well into the throes of addiction when somebody has gained that addictive substance and they have continued to do that. So like it almost moves from uh, choice to a biological model. And I feel like that doesn't that's not characteristic of other diseases that they talk about in medical in the medical space. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's so much to sort of unpack here. One of the things I like to think about is when we think about, as you were sort of alluding to, the onset of these things, which is the onset of disease often, if not most of the time, is kind of unknown to us. We don't know, like, we couldn't behave with respect to the conditions under which that disease was acquired because we don't always know. And, like, doing behavior X does not mean that you'll get disease even though you know that it's a risk for behavior X that you might get that disease. So let's say, for example, that like you're someone who works in hazardous chemicals, you know that there is a, a inherent risk with working with chemicals that you might get cancer. So you maybe suit up and protect yourself and you try and get all the gear to prevent the likelihood that there's going that the exposure to those chemicals is going to have that adverse outcome. But we don't know. Like it's pot like people who never work around those chemicals might get the disease associated with exposure to those chemicals. And with addiction, it's pretty clear what the onset is. Like you usually yeah. walked head on into it, looking right at it the whole time. Right? right. And it's sort of like thinking about when we get disease, as I said, we don't know where it comes from. Sometimes it's something we breathe in. Sometimes it's something that touches our skin or penetrates our skin. Sometimes it's something that develops inside of us. Sometimes it's something that we even potentially let in not knowing that it had that component. But you don't like touch a doorknob and get alcoholism just because the person who had alcoholism before you who touched a doorknob. Right. And so like the contagion – that is characteristic of many diseases. The onset, which is characteristic of many diseases, just doesn't have a lot of consistent overlap with the kind of features that the substances and behaviors do around addiction, where we pretty much can observe what those are right ahead of time. And in most of the diseases, we can't. I think that's a great point, too. And, and I think another thing to unpack inside of this is the exposure model versus the susceptibility models that they talk about inside of this. I think exposure models make sense from a behavioral standpoint and just from a general disease standpoint, right? Like if somebody gets exposed sure. to some condition, then they are more likely to catch whatever that condition is, you know, by that. I think, again, when it comes to addiction, because so much of it relies on behavior as part of the onset that slips towards a more pathological issue, then your exposure model here is not prolonged exposure to some virus or bacteria or some type of biological disease. What you start finding here is it's more a learned process or exposure by environment or something like that. It's a very different type of exposure, you know, or just kind of like a slope into leading into addictions. Whereas like the susceptibility model is saying that you you're addicted without ever being exposed or like you have such a high risk of being addicted that basically you're addicted without ever having 
displayed any of the pathology of addiction. And I think the susceptibility model is a little bit, I think that's a little bit of a slippery slope, but I think you hear a lot of people talk about that. I think I, my brother, as an example, will never drink and he will, I mean, he says it constantly. He'll never drink. He'll never do drugs because in my, in my family, alcoholism has run rampant. And so he's so afraid of that, that like, as part of that susceptibility piece, he's afraid that he's so susceptible to that, that he actively avoids that. But by this model, it would say that he is either very at risk or he's already addicted and he just doesn't engage with it. So like there's I just have some problems with the the assumptions inside of both of these. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair is that it doesn't seem to capture it, it basically puts a pathology on something that's not happening. Right. Right. Like presumably all of us have the potential to get cancer, but treating all of us as if we currently have cancer would first of all, completely overwhelm our medical infrastructure. <laughs> right? <laughs> like every single person on earth, like all of a sudden has like terminal illness is definitely a problem that we do not have the facilities to address. But second of all, I think it's not helpful because it's dealing with a problem that doesn't exist yet. And in a system of triage, we often want to start with like, where is the place at which we can make the most benefit the quickest and we can't just treat every single thing as if they're all the highest priority like we've got to sort of titrate that down so i think it's not very practical to consider that we just treat people as having addiction when they when they're not engaging in those behaviors although i think you know the preventative strategy of just don't do x if you can maintain that that's probably your best bet i mean in this case because yeah it's similar to like smoking right it's like you might get lung cancer even though you never smoked but the chances of you getting lung cancer are way higher if you do smoke and so let's just not smoke if that's something you can choose not to do and decrease the likelihood that you'll ever get lung cancer and it's like it's not a guarantee Right. But we're, we're not going to treat you as if you currently have lung cancer, but we're going to if you if you have the prevention strategy in there. And I think nicotine actually is an interesting thing to speak about in terms of addiction here, too, because it's so tightly linked to disease. I can see where there's like a lot of overlap with with those ideas there. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably worth unpacking a little bit. Like, I mean, we've kind of said this already, but I think we all want to get into like the nitty gritty about why disease models might be a problem for this particular type of issue, right? So as a general rule, just to kind of go back, I think the disease model can be useful in a medical space. Like by identifying some type of outside influence, medical treatment can focus on curing the disease. And I want to I want to emphasize that that so many times in medical models, we focus on curing the disease. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Yeah. So whether the disease is acute or chronic, there is the idea somewhere that the disease can be eliminated, or at least there's hope that it can be eliminated. And that is, I think, a core kind of feature of a general disease model as kind of the way that it's implemented, at least in the United States. And by taking a medical approach to addiction, we can account for an acute problem. And attempt to target that disease through, you know, again, said disease, whatever that is, through specific treatment. However, as I, I sort of said, like often we don't necessarily know what the onset is for a particular disease, but there is one. <laughs> and with addiction, it's so much more complicated because it doesn't have a single cause, right? It's such a complex like branching spider web of contextual variables that lead to and support and maintain addiction and dependency, the history of use, the psychological impacts, all of the cues in our environment, uh, our social supports, whatever motivating variables may be contributing to our choice to use in the first place or continue to use or return to it at some point in the future. Like it's very, very widely variable. And with disease, it's, it's usually like a thing, right? Like right. breathing in a bacteria that gives you a bacterial infection is a thing. It's not that like, oh, well, this bacteria was hanging out with its right bacteria friends and you just happen to be in the sort of the right vulnerable condition. And, you know, it, it happened. To, I don't know. There's like it's not so complex because we have I mean, it's complex in a lot of ways. But in this in this sort of onset part of this, we think about like there was a thing that happened that caused that disease to develop inside of us. And addiction just has a lot of converging routes, of uh, variables. And I mean, at any given point in our life, there's just like a million overlapping routes of things, of variables that are going on with us. Right. And some of those might converge on addiction. For a lot of people, for probably most people, they don't. But for some people, they do. 
Absolutely. And I think this brings me to kind of the most troubling or concerning part of applying a disease model to addiction specifically, because when you are looking at the disease model with the idea that there is a cure, that means that for addiction, there would be a cure and there are topics of curing addiction. Uh, And so by asserting that addiction is a disease, by definition of the disease model, there is a cure, whether that addiction is chronic or acute. It's still the idea that like, ah, here's a specific thing that we can specifically treat and that we can specifically get rid of. Right. Right. And that I think is that creates some problems. So I kind of want to I want to talk about this a little bit because I think, you know, there is this idea that somebody who is struggling with substance abuse disorders or somebody who is struggling with addiction as a general rule. I think those folks when they enter a space where there is discussions of cures, I think that that creates a level of false hope for people to think that the idea of getting cured means they will never struggle with this thing again. Right. Right. So you get rid of this thing entirely. You can go, you know, excise this from your body and then you're done with it. Right. But that's not ever, ever how addiction works, given the complexities and given the type of psychological and emotional processes and social processes that go along with this. I think that calling addiction a disease inside of this model might actually be creating more problems for folks who are entering, looking for treatment and looking for a quote unquote cure. That's just kind of my general thought on that. And you're thinking this because they'll basically think, oh, I've been cured I'm fine now. Is is that sort of what you're? Yeah, I'm. I, I've been cured. I don't need to ever worry about this thing again. I see. Okay, and you know, I think that there again, we can certainly draw parallels to diseases that exist. So like cancer can go into remission and, and then come back. Right. We can see people who get chronic illnesses that never really go away, even with a lot of maintenance and treatment. And so, like, I can again, we can draw those parallels. Because as you said, because it's so complex, because we have so many variables that lead to the onset and maintenance and development and evolution, if you will, of the behaviors around a dependency, then whatever treatment looks like is going to be a very multifaceted, comprehensive model as well, because it has to address all those different variables, or at least most of those variables, to get behavior to change course. Right. Because as we were sort of talking about, the behaviors themselves involve oftentimes a change to our biology anyway, which then changes what our motivations are going to be in those different circumstances. And this is largely chemical addictions. I mean, if we think about other sort of behavioral addictions, even in those cases, we're still doing some, like we're practicing a behavior so often that you can make the argument that we're changing part of our neurological processes and sort of how we're essentially building a high level of fluency, which means a lot of neural connections around particular behavior patterns. And so those do also become like a change to our overall biology, if you will, just is sort of similar to like how we introduce a bunch of chemicals to our brain, to our lungs, to our livers, et cetera, that those also then change how those function, which then change how we interact with our world around us. And so those are just multifaceted components of dependency type behaviors that you may have to consider is like what are now are our current motivations, maybe from what they were before we started using something to what we what they are now after we've started using something that have altered what those are. And as you said, the social components, there are now the psychological components, if you will, of often as they're being used for some particular variable. And we become, as we mentioned before, oftentimes what happens when you use is that you go into a state of like the state of using a substance becomes baseline and not using a substance becomes painful. And so then it's using just to avoid pain right? and be at baseline, right? And so that becomes a whole new thing is like, okay, so now what can we do to get you to baseline without that substance? And that just doesn't that doesn't really reflect a lot of how the other diseases sort of work. As you were talking about this, I was thinking about, let's say, the example of somebody who has a pretty significant cancer diagnosis and they're struggling with with that particular diagnosis and the treatment around it. Right. So there are a lot of things that can happen inside of that. Somebody may have to have an amputation as a result of that and deal with the fallout of that particular procedure, right? So they're they're struggling with uh, anxiety around that. They're struggling with depression around that, whatever, whatever other things might be going on. But I think that is the thing. And this is where I could see people really glomming on to this idea of addiction as a model, as part of a disease, because addiction 
just like cancer can lead to all of this other fallout, right? So addiction is here. Now this person is using, now they're in, they're getting despondent. Then now they're experiencing anxiety or they're using because of anxiety, or there's a lot of things that could happen. Right. But with cancer, you have the same kind of thing. This disease has led to a decrease in some quality of life, which has resulted in these other psychological detriments to this person. And I could see, I could see somebody looking at addiction and doing the same thing and going, well, cancer, I mean, I'm, and just to be clear, I'm not saying they're the same thing. I don't want anybody coming after us and being like cancer yeah. addiction. Or something. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is I could see the parallels. Yeah, we're kind of saying the opposite directly. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, right. Where the idea is like, I could see somebody going cancer, bad leads to bad things drop off in quality of life. Addiction bad leads to bad things drop off in quality of life for that person. I could see that parallel as part of somebody's discussion or at least mentality around this. I can see that. And also ads bad lead to a decrease in quality of podcast. All right, let's get to talking about sort of cure versus management and talking about addiction and the, the disease model here. So as I was kind of putting the notes together on this, I was thinking about a lot of the discussion around prognosis and treatment outcomes, because so much so many times and you'll hear doctors that can never promise anything, but they'll say the prognosis is good because of X, Y and Z, right? Whatever treatment conditions right. are going on. So by calling addiction a disease, though. It implies that there is a cure of sorts inside of that, right? Or some kind of treatment. Some kind of treatment, at least, right? Or some kind of really positive effect of that treatment. But most of the discussions around addiction treatment indicate that addiction never really goes away. It, it kind of stays with that person on some level, or at least the, the impact or the psychological or emotional you know, kind of impacts of that. And so instead, people who are struggling with substance often face this challenge indefinitely. So once somebody has gained or like gotten to the space where that, you know, formally they have an addiction, they struggle with that forever. Now there's no cure for the cravings or the, I mean, there, maybe there can be on some level, but the, the idea that you have an addiction, you have this thing and it can be cured is I feel like a false flag and it produces some, I think, some quality of life issues for folks that are going into treatment, wanting support, thinking they're going to be cured and realizing that it's never going to happen. It'd be also a little bit tough to ask people to, I think, consider the reason you have this disease, cancer, whatever it is, is because something that, well, I guess cancer actually does have some direct parallels here, but the reason you have this disease is that something you're doing that is really hard for you to not do. And I need you to just not do that thing anymore. Right. And that you're sort of responsible for that now. But anyway, you know, I think taking a moment to understand between the difference between curing a disease and managing a disease with a cure, we have relief. We could be an animal person of the symptoms and often underlying pathology of the disease or condition versus management. We have the process of dealing with or controlling the things or or the people just sort of indefinitely. And there are diseases that have this characteristic. But as you said, I think that's pretty much always the characteristic of addictive and uh, dependency and addiction behaviors is that there is, I think, pretty much always a risk of relapse. And I think the thing is, is I think that risk of relapse is different than the risk of relapse for something like cancer, because for something like cancer, you might have certain psychological processes where there are certain cues that remind you of your treatment or anything like that, right? There are some things that can happen inside of that. But for addiction, there are cues that are like, oh, I know where I can score. I know where I can get this. This is where I used to drink with my buddies. This is where I used to do this. And those are more readily available things that could be choices that somebody can make inside of that environment. But I think understanding all of that, right, by definition, is addiction ever cured? Not at all. OK, because it's not a disease to be cured per se, but by definition, addiction is as a disease would likely be classified as a chronic disease, which, you know, if we're kind of playing that that devil's advocate piece, addiction could be classified as a chronic disease in that the conditions persist longer than a year. And so somebody who is diagnosed with addiction or a substance abuse disorder that lasts for this chronic kind of use that use happens for over a year. It's prolonged. And it means that they're kind of constantly struggling with it. Similar to chronic diseases like Alzheimer's or epilepsy, something that lasts much longer than just an acute treatment condition. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's take, for example, the, the, someone gets like uh, gangrene 
And so they get, I don't even know what the treatment is for gangrene, but, you know, they get some kind of medicine, antibacterial maybe, or antiviral medication that I, <laughs> I'm exposing my ignorance about the, uh, <laughs> the exact pathology or etiology of that. But anyway, point being that, like, they get that and then they sort of, like, whatever it was that they did that sort of gave them gangrene, they just sort of, you know, avoid that <laughs> avoid that thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably fairly easy to do versus something like, as you said— um, someone who was maybe smoking or drinking or using some other harder substances, cocaine or heroin or something else, the cues for that aren't something we can get rid of. You know, we can get rid of the thing that caused, you know, whatever X. If you had testicular cancer and had testicles removed, like you can't get testicular cancer anymore because you, <laughs> you don't have any testicles, right. Right? right? But we can't just go through and just remove every psychological cue that has ever impacted you in relation to uh, addictive behaviors. We just can't do that. We can, you know, we can't turn the world off. There, I think that's an element of this uh, that I think where you see it doesn't quite have the same overlap. Well, and I think, too, when we start thinking about medical models of diseases, most of those medical models might enlist other supports to address other things, right? So like, for example, when you have somebody who has a chronic illness, you might be enlisting the services of somebody who does specialized palliative care. Or you might enlist family counseling services as a separate part of the treatment package, not necessarily the direct intervention for treating that disease. Like you're kind of treating additional fallout and symptoms of that, too. So I think that there's something interesting in looking at addiction from the space of there's not a medical treatment for it that is as prominent as the psychological or the emotional or the behavioral treatments that are in place, right? So like with cancer, you're, you've got radiation treatment, you've got surgery, you've got these things that happen. Those don't exist for addiction. So they don't even fit in line with what a disease is from the medical model and how those medical models are actually actively treat those. Like right. it almost always gets deferred to, unless it's like withdrawal symptoms, it almost always gets deferred to some treatment center that usually includes psychological well-being practices or something like that. So I think, you know, just understanding kind of like how it even gets approached from this space doesn't even align with a medical model in that regard. Like it ends up in a space where it's just management and not curing. As we're having this discussion, my thoughts are evolving on this, and I'm, I'm eager to kind of explore these as we get toward the end and have our, our sort of big summary take home about, about this whole discussion. But I think mm -hmm. let's let's talk about how, how the disease model may or may not align with a more scientific, I think, objective psychological orientation to thinking about addiction, more or less. Yeah. Let's unpack that for a second. As I was kind of putting these notes together, my first thought is that, you know, early in the in the episode, I was kind of going and I still kind of had this thought is like, I don't think that it's fair to call addiction a disease. But I do think the kind of the philosophies of this it aligns well with kind of the general perspectives of behaviorism. Right. So, for example, behavior is not the organism's fault. It's a result of the environment. Disease is not the organism's fault. It's a result of the environment. Responses occur and addiction occur as definable links to their environment and behavior is reinforced. Addiction related behaviors are reinforced and they're maintained over time. Right. So those things we kind of I kind of lean back on this idea that behavior is not the organism's fault. Disease is not this organism's fault. And that parallel is so strong to me that it's kind of made me start kind of like you said, my thoughts around this have evolved in a different way because of that particular perspective. Yeah, where these viewpoints diverge is is a couple of places. One important one is the cure perspective, as we've discussed. Behaviorism doesn't really aim to cure. What it's doing instead is it is developing adaptive skills that can support this individual's quality of life. And this aligns more with what actually happens with addiction and treatment for addiction anyway, right? Is And when we talk about a lot of, in psychology, what we're doing is we are looking for the development and fostering of new sort of behaviors and skills, which isn't what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to build something new, not remove something bad. Yeah. And like there, I think, is the sort of fundamental change in a pathological view of disease where it's like remove the thing that's causing harm. And in this position instead, in our philosophy, we're like, we can't remove that thing. We can't pull it out of you. We <laughs> yeah. can't cut it out. We can't inject something into it to make it go away. 
what we can do instead and what we do attempt to do instead is to help add a new set of skills and approaches that will make it so that the thing that you're doing is not as powerfully controlling over your behavior. And so it's building new skills and it's, it's like adding something rather than taking something away. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to look at it because I think, you know, when you think about treatment and we're, and we're going to spend some more episodes talking about kind of different ways that addictions are treated. But when you think about it, treatment, Many, many, many times, most of the time, it's not just about getting somebody off of a substance. It's also about teaching them those adaptive skills to avoid the substance, to cope with not having the substance, to cope with whatever they were using the substance for when it comes to their own psychological well-being. Like, I mean, so much of it is, like you said, building something new, not necessarily removing something from the biology of the person. And I think that 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 fundamental difference is really what solidifies it all for me that the disease model does not align with what even actually happens inside of addiction. I think that there are medical components, right? It does arrive in the medical space where somebody is experiencing significant, severe withdrawal symptoms and they need medical yeah. intervention to stabilize themselves. Like that is, and that yeah. goes back to the kind of the biology side of, of addiction, right? That piece is there, but that's one small part. And I don't think that's the active ingredient for treating addiction. Whereas like, with something like cancer, the active ingredient is a medical treatment. It is part of a medical model to treat a pathology, to remove something from your biology. So I think you, what you just described tied it all up in a nice, neat little bow for me was like, yes, we are <laughs> building something brand new. We are addressing something that was missing from this person's skill set versus removing something to improve that person's quality of life. Well, thank you. I think we have some interesting tidbits or um, tidboints, as I've sometimes called them. <laughs> Love tidboints. <laughs> and then I think time to sort of give our final thoughts on this and sort of wrap it up and how we want to leave this. So uh, we'll do our, do our final advertisement intervention. Boo. Yeah. And then we'll come back and, and wrap this up. Okay, let's let's go ahead and talk about some other sort of interesting pieces here that are, that are worth unpacking. So as far as the models of addiction, there were two other ones that are talked about often. And my perspective is I imagine that all three of these are typically tied together to help address uh, addiction because it's so complex. But one of them is the psychological model and the other is the social learning model. The psychological model primarily focuses on psychological and emotional factors that have contributed to the development and the sustaining of that addiction. And basically what it says is that addiction stems from some unresolved trauma or poor coping mechanisms. And so the psychological model tends to kind of look at a causal approach, but from a psychological standpoint, Point instead of from like a biological or medical standpoint. And then the social learning model is the idea that addiction is influenced by social factors and the environment, which it definitely <laughs> definitely is. Sure. Yeah. That that also is, is worth looking at as like a way of unpacking the sort of models of an understanding addictive and, and dependency behaviors. As I was kind of looking at this stuff too, and you know, the idea of the disease model is to not attribute blame to the person who's struggling, but neither of these do that either. Sure. So, you know, the psychological model doesn't do that. It's like, oh, like, like you're missing skills. It's not your fault. Let's teach you skills. Or, you know, you went through some stuff and that sounds really hard and it makes sense that you would cope this way. Let's go ahead and get you some treatment to help you with that because none of that was your fault either. Or you were around some people that were really bad and they influenced you and the environment just set you up for not success, but for failure in this space. Not again, not your fault. Let's get you some treatment to kind of get you out of that, right? All three of these models absolutely divert blame away from the organism and onto some other circumstance, which I think is critically important for understanding addiction. Yes, absolutely. So I'm sort of chomping at the bit here, eager to, uh, <laughs> to I think, summarize this discussion as well as sort of my, my thoughts on this as we've been talking. And I think the first is that when you break it all down, you, you start to realize, I think, that addiction is just, it's more complicated than a disease. And I'm sure that like any immunopathologist person or uh, person who specializes in diseases is going to scoff at me tremendously. But what I mean by it's more complicated is that there is a myriad of factors 
errors, sometimes that we can identify and many times that we cannot. There's just dozens or hundreds or thousands of them that all contribute to the development of addiction behaviors, right? And most of the sort of disease models, like even though there can be a lot of things that cause any one particular disease and we don't know what they all are a lot of the time, like it tends to be like there's a thing and just what happens with addiction is it has so many variable inputs that establish and maintain and though those inputs shift and change and evolve as the as the organism's learning that like it's really hard to pin down and you're also dealing with the volatility of people's behavior right at the same time so like it is very complicated it can't be cured and it's influenced by environmental factors and learning Skill deficits with coping, access to highly reinforcing and valuable substances, etc. And by calling it a disease, where we sort of imply that it can be cured, when we kind of when we don't think that a lot of times it really can in the way that you might think of a cure for some kind of disease. And instead, what we're doing is managing the behavioral, psychological, and emotional concerns that go with it, often by establishing new sets of skills, new behaviors, new approaches to help overcome all the environmental and social factors that are there. Absolutely. One of my take home points on this would be that I think it's very easy for a person who does not understand addiction to fall into thinking that this model makes sense. It's a very easy model that makes sense, right? It, this person's not blamed. There's hope for a cure. And it leaves more complicated psychological or emotional processes kind of behind in terms of understanding kind of the mechanisms by which addiction occurs. But I do think that, you know, for me, where I end up landing is that does it ultimately matter that we're using a disease model to describe this? Because many times it's, you know, truly when you think about it, the disease model is just kind of a metaphor for what's going on. It's not an actual like disease that can be observed. It's kind of like this metaphor for describing what's going on. I actually don't think it's that much of a problem to call it a disease in terms of kind of the layperson discussion. I think it becomes more of a problem when it comes to having that discussion inside of medical circles where it neglects these other factors, right? So I think that calling by by solely using a disease model, I think it neglects the social learning. I think it neglects psychological processes in ways that I think maybe more comprehensive addiction treatments don't actually do. Sure. Yeah. I think that that's fair. And you sort of said this and now I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you uh, on this because I think when I initially have thought about this and talked about it, I just really balked at the idea of calling addiction a disease. It felt counterintuitive to me. Yeah. And it also, it had a problem. I had a really hard time putting my finger on exactly what that problem was. And as we've talked about this, as, as you have sort of said, I think I've actually evolved and say like, there are a lot of parallels between looking at understanding disease and how we look at addiction. Like even when we talk about things like cancer and we can often draw that specifically to something like smoking or using some substance that, that is very likely to cause cancer or create the opportunity for cancer to develop, it starts to become really fuzzy because like there are specific behaviors that are associated with that too. So there are a lot of parallels. And and the other point that you made that I really liked was that like the medical portion of this is a portion of this. It is a component. What I think it does is it's not a comprehensive component. And so as you said, what I like about it is that the whole intention originally was like, let's remove the blame side of this from people. And that is what I think a psychological perspective on addiction is. It looks at like the thing that you're doing, you are doing because all of the circumstances in your life provided the opportunity, motivation, and direction toward that thing. Yeah. And that thing in this case being addiction, using heroin, using cocaine, using meth, you know, whatever it is, or behavioral addictions, all of the circumstances, you couldn't have done that if you didn't have the opportunity, you wouldn't have done it if you didn't have the motivation. All of those things had to converge. They drove you there. You ended up in this place. So calling it a choice is useless. It's beyond useless. It's harmful. Right. And so right. I see why the addiction or the disease model has so much appeal to advocates for supporting people through their addiction. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. Where I think I'm starting to be able to articulate why I don't like it is it comes actually back to this idea of powerlessness. When we have like hepatitis, I can't just be like, 
I've seen the light. I'm going to change my behavior and my hepatitis will go away. Right. Like right. someone could put in a set of circumstances that'll have me change the things that I'm doing and my, my disease will be cured. That's just not how those work. And so it's this powerlessness that I, that I do not like about the disease model where, again, it's not that it's all bad. I, I see a lot of overlap and utility in it. Yeah. But when we start to then say like – like so many diseases that are out of control, addiction is out of your control, then again, what we've done is we've withdrawn the ability to start to build those new skills. Because if it's outside of your control, skill building won't do anything. It's outside of your control. Right. If it was within <laughs> your control, like you'd be able to get over it, but it's not. So you can't and you're just screwed. Right. And that's just not how behavior works. And so that's the part that I feel like I've sort of finally able to articulate that I don't like about the ideas, the disease model is that it takes away our ability to look at this as how can we be productive and counter to this because the person does have control over this. They don't have control over their, their cancer. Yes. They can stop doing the thing that gave them cancer in the first place. They can take their medicines, but there's nothing they can do that's going to make it just go away. We can give them skills that will make their drinking stop. Yeah. That will make their substance use decrease. We can watch those things happen. And so like... It's complicated. It's difficult. There's no guarantee that it's going to work. But what, like, if we treat it as if there's something that you can't do about it, then what what do we do? You know, we can't do anything. Right. And so that's why that's what I don't like about it, I I think, is or the part of it that bugs me. It's not that I don't I I think that it's completely useless, as as I've articulated now, I think a couple of times I totally get the value that's brought by the disease model. I can totally draw a million parallels between disease and addiction. Yeah. And the problem that I have with it is this idea that it then withdraws the ability to intervene by empowering the individual to make different choices. And and I think that the advocates would say that it doesn't, but I just I just strongly disagree. Yeah. By saying you don't have power over this thing, you are literally saying you can't control it. And we just know that that's not true. So that's that's I think what I wanted to land on is just sort of imparting that piece that the disease model to me and how I hear it and maybe people disagree and they just don't hear it this way and that's fine. But what it applies to me is, is a lack of ability to do something about it. And I don't think that that's useful. I agree with that too. And I think this is the same problem that we run into with any model of treatment in any space is that it often gets treated as the monolith, as the only thing that's being done. And that's not what's going on here. Like not even close. Right. I think by itself. Yeah. There are gaps just like I think any theory, any model, any practice has gaps. I mean, we talk about this with behaviorism all the time. The gaps in behaviorism, they do exist. And so I think, you know, subscribing to a single, I mean, I would say I would make an argument that behaviorism clears more of those gaps than other models do. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. But I think at the same time, like, I think alone, a disease model is, it can be a problem. I think in combination with these other models of addiction, I think together, I think that you get a more comprehensive, more progressive, more forward moving model of treatment that is designed to give somebody sustained skills and move away from the detriments in the in the poor quality of life that comes with addiction and addiction disorders and substance abuse disorders. Absolutely. I think that that's. That's what we have to say on this. Is there any more that we that we should add? I don't know. I feel like I've I, I went on the longest of all rants, um, <laughs> but <laughs> and but I thought you ended that beautifully. No, I actually don't have anything else. All right, lovely. Well, um, if you would like to write in and tell us what we got wrong, what we got right, what you liked, what you didn't like, leave us some very thoughtful, kind, compassionate criticism, or just give us some heaping amounts of praise. We like all of that stuff. You can reach out to us directly. Email us at info at www.wwdpodcast.com www.wwdpodcast.com or all the social media platforms all the regular social media platforms, and we will respond to you there. We also do like to do this really fun thing where we recommend some things that are pretty much always completely unrelated to our discussion at hand, which will be the Uh case today. And I will save that part for the end because we're going to get through all of the credits first. 
If you'd like to support the show, you can join us on Patreon. There you get access to all kinds of behind the scenes content, extra goodies. You can like and subscribe, leave a rating and review, share this episode with a friend, pick up some merch at our merch store. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And we appreciate any and all of them at all. Just this five star yes. click, easy to do, wonderful, helps us a lot. Thank you so much for doing it. Joining us on Patreon, even greater. And the great people on Patreon that have already made that leap that whom whom we so appreciate for doing so includes Mike M. Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, Brian, Ashley, Kiara, Christy, and Michelle. Thank you all for your continued awesomeness and being awesome and doing the awesome things for all the awesome reasons. You're the awesomest. Yes, you beautiful, beautiful people. We love you. Indeed. But, all, you know, if you can't or don't want to do it that way, the other ways that you can support us are also helpful. Um, and we definitely appreciate whatever you are willing to do if you if you like us or even if you don't, you can support us. And even if you don't like us and we're OK with that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It, it all works. You're your own autonomous person. Do whatever you want. Yes. Without my uh, wonderful team of people, I could not make this show happen. Writing and fact checking from Shane and myself. Shane, thank you so much for recording with me today and for putting together all the notes on today's discussion. Hey. Anytime. No, this is great. Absolutely. All the editing magic that makes it sound like we are speaking in normal sentences comes from Justin. (laughs) And then our social media coordinator is Emma Wilson. Is there anything you would like to add or anything that I forgot before we get to our recommendations? Uh, Not on my end. Okay. Now you get to the fun part. We're going to recommend some stuff for you. So stick around. Yay. After these ads. Oh. Okay, let's get to some recommendations. We just came back from an audio transition. We'll do another quick audio transition. Yay! Recommendations. I am recommending something. I'm not sure if I've recommended this before. Maybe I have, but I'm going to recommend it either way. This is a brand of knives called Cutco Knives. There's a couple things I like about Cutco knives. First of all, I think many people will who are on the spectrum of things will appreciate that I, that this is an American company. So if that's your bag, cool. They also just make really high quality knives. And here's here's one of the things that I like about Cutco. They tend to have like lifetime guarantee uh, warranties, or not even that, but like forever warranties. I think something like that. I'm not sure on the policy because I believe that you can pass these down like generations. And so essentially. Where I think this is awesome in particular is that that means that they guarantee their product indefinitely. And if it breaks, if it chips, if something goes wrong, you can send it in, they'll replace it. All you have to pay for is postage, right? Yeah. And that means that for them, the incentive is to build the best quality product they can because they really don't want to have to continually <laughs> ship out new versions of their product, right? Yeah. And so they tend to make these really high quality knives. I mean, they are fantastic. They're really well designed. They're ergonomic. They're very, very sharp. They have all kinds of different designs for different types of cutting you might do. There's very, very thin knives. There's very, very thick knives. There's serrated knives. There's all these different designs and they have these specific uses for them that they recommend. Of course, a knife is you know basically a sharp piece of metal. So you use it to cut things, right. but some of them cut the other thing, you know, some things better than others. Um, and so that's, they have these recommended anyway, they just make these really high quality knives. They are expensive, but again, you get that big guarantee. And it's been one of those nice things where after getting a whole set of cut coat knives that I used to go to the store and whenever I'd see one of those nice, fancy knife blocks, I'd be like, oh, I wish I had those knives instead of the knives I currently have. And since I've gotten <laughs> cut coat knives, I literally don't even notice those other knife blocks anymore. Wow. Cause they're like, I don't care because like I have the best knives that I will ever need because they're they're really fantastic. And as I said, they are on the pricier end, but it is like the last time you'll ever buy that type of knife and then they cover it forever. I really like them. They also, by the way, they'll have representatives come and sharpen the you know, knives at your house for free. Like you can buy a knife sharpener, but like they have these special blocks just for sharpening the serrated blades. Yeah. And so they'll just say like, how often would you like to come out once a year, every two years, every three years? And then that person will stop by They'll like, you know, they'll message you to, to schedule an appointment. They'll stop by, they'll sharpen your knives. 
be on their way. And they'll just do that as a service that they provide. I strongly recommend Cutco. I really like their products. Um, they seem like they really actually care about making a good product. And they've put the onus of responsibility on themselves to do that. And just as a side note, they also make cutting boards that are really nice. They make a whole bunch of pots and pans, if that's your thing, and a few other accessories like apple peelers and ice cream scoops and can openers yeah. and stuff. And it's just like all high quality stuff. So um, anyway, that's my recommendation is Cutco Knives. I love that. I want so badly to go take cooking classes just so I can learn mm. some new skills. Yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to get was like my own like set of knives to just be like, these are mine. Don't touch them. Don't use them. Let me use these. So um, I'm going to look into this. This will be fun. Yeah. And there might be like some kind of referral thing that you can like kick back a credit my way or something. So uh, yeah. if they ask, uh, drop my name. Uh, yeah, I got you. Yeah. But it's, it's worth looking into. They'd like set up all kinds, like they'll set up at like Costco and they'll set up at like malls and stuff. Sometimes they'll have these little d- setups. So if you look around and notice them, you might stop by and just check out their stuff. I recommend getting a block at least because that way you have like a nice way to, to sort of store your whole set. But, you know, whatever works for you. I just think they make really good products. Yeah, I love that. So my recommendation doesn't involve Cutco knives. There are bone knives in this movie. (laughs) So I got to see Godzilla X Kong New Empire. And let me tell you, ooh, dude, here's the thing. I think that people are so up their own butts about fun (laughs) and they just do not (laughs) let themselves have fun. This movie is so ridiculously fun because it's ex- it's exactly what you want out of a, a movie with Godzilla and King Kong. It is giant monsters destroying a lot of things and just beating the crap out of each other. How could you want anything else? Like when I describe it, it, it goes like this. It goes, the movie starts with King Kong running from giant mutant wolves. And then he destroys all of the mutant wolves. And then he has to fight Godzilla. Then he fights Godzilla with his own robotic arm prosthetic. And he carries an axe that has a scale from Godzilla embedded in bone. He has a bone axe that he fights. And then he also fights a giant orangutan named Scar King that has a bone whip. Like, it rules! I don't know why people (laughs) don't like these movies. It's just so fun. And you don't have to think about it. And it just rules. And it just it just confirms that King Kong might be the coolest. <laughs> you know, I got to say, because it's like I never got really into the Fast and Furious movies. And the reason for me was they seemed like they were trying to be grounded in some form of reality. And they uh-huh. were just really hard to swallow. And I just also am not that interested, interested in cars. But right. So, like, I never really followed that franchise. No, you know, no disrespect to people who like it. It just wasn't really in my bag. Any movie that completely is like, reality be damned, <laughs> like that yeah. part's out the window. This is just nonsense for the sake of nonsense. I'm pretty easy to suspend my disbelief and just get on board with because I already knew walking in the door what I was getting, right? Like this yeah. is a fantasy thing. It's not meant to be grounded in reality in any way. And I mean, <laughs> Godzilla wielding a bone axe with a scale of Godzilla is just good writing, right? There. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Can, it's yeah, It's absurd. It's just someone who's like, let's really have fun with this. And they just went ham on it and like, good for them. So that's lovely. Um, I'm, so, Dude, <laughs> I'm so happy to hear this. It's so good. There's a scene where King Kong rides on Godzilla's back into battle. <laughs> I, how do you hate that? How do you hate that? If you hate that, grow up. <laughs> that's pretty fabulous. Yeah, it's so ridiculous. So anyway. It was a blast. Go see it. Really, at that point, all you need is just like, you know, make the movie make some amount of sense and, and then just write fun <laughs> yeah. parts and then you're you're good. As long as you can yeah. just like f- sort of follow it. Honestly, I'd go one of two directions. Either have a nice, easy to follow narrative that like is it helps just sort of tie the whole story together and like this thing makes sense when it happens, this thing, or completely abandon the narrative and just like have fun with a lot of super crazy images of people of like giant monsters fighting each other. That's yeah, all we need. That's what this movie did. And it was great. Great. If you'd like to talk to us about Cutco Knives or Godzilla or anything about uh, addiction as disease that we talked about here, you should reach out to us. But I already said that part, so I think that that's all I have. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, nothing else. All right, then thank you for listening. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. 